Welcome to the Screen the Screener College Basketball Podcast with your hosts, Mike Randall and Gus Kearns. For a coach that has had so much success, Rick Barnes really flies under the radar. You don't have a lot of people who are Rick Barnes guys, right? You have Mike Krzyzewski guys, you have Rick Pitino guys, John Calipari guys, Mark View guys, even some of those smaller school success coaches. You have Greg Marshall guys. You have Steve Forbes guys at East Tennessee State. You had Mike Young guys at Wofford, now at Virginia Tech. But Rick Barnes flies under the radar. He's had as much experience across different programs as any of those guys. Was successful as a head coach at George Mason and Providence and Clemson. Then he goes to Texas, which doesn't support basketball nearly as much as football there and turns it into a tremendously successful basketball program, more so than they had ever had. Barnes coaches for 17 years at Texas, gets them to a Final Four in 2002-2003, gets them to two Elite Eights in 2005-2006 and 2007-2008, but then fails to get past the round of 32 for seven consecutive years. And at that point, Texas says, with all our resources and everything that we have, You should have done better. So he's fired from Texas. And where does he go? Tennessee. And we learned in this upcoming interview with Wes Rucker of 24-7 Sports for the Tennessee Volunteers that when he was hired, John Calipari said, you don't realize how good a hire that is. You don't realize how well Rick Barnes is going to do at Tennessee with a program that supports basketball a heck of a lot better than Texas does. He walks into Tennessee in 2015 after following Quanzo Martin and Donnie Tyndall. Tyndall, who has to leave because he lied about violations when he was coaching at Southern Mississippi. So in many ways, when Barnes arrives in 2015, Tennessee is in a disaster and they hire Rick Barnes. He's not a bombastic guy. He doesn't have the slickness of a Cal or Patino or Shashevsky, but he teaches his teams to play good, hard-nosed basketball, and they usually find success. And in his first four years at Tennessee, the Volunteers in the Southeastern Conference, one of the top conferences for college basketball in the country, they go from 6-12, and 12, 12th place, to 8-10, and 10, ninth place, to 13-5, and 5, tied for first, and then 15-3, and 3, tied for second. They make the Sweet 16 in 2018-2019, losing a tough overtime game to the Purdue Boilermakers, who then went on to lose an incredibly tough game to Virginia. In many ways, if the Volunteers could have gotten past Purdue, they possibly could have beaten Virginia and stopped their NCAA tournament title run. And so coming into this year, after losing such big-name players as Admiral Schofield and Grant Williams and Jordan Bone, People thought it was going to be a gap year. People thought it was going to be a down year, but not for Rick Barnes. Despite losing senior guard Lamonte Turner early in the year, Barnes actually turns things around, gets this program to 17 and 14, 9 and 9 in the SEC with two of the last three games, defeating Florida at home and Kentucky on the road, who may have been the second best team in the country, not named Kansas. So today we're going to talk Tennessee Volunteers basketball. We're going to bring in Wes Rucker, senior writer at Go Vols 24-7. He covers the volunteers for 24-7 Sports and CBS Sports and is a contributor at WBIR-TV. You can follow him on Twitter and you should follow him on Twitter at Wes Rucker 247 where he covers all things volunteers. And he's going to come on to the Screen the Screener season review series today to talk about Tennessee, to talk about how this team responded after losing Turner, talk about how Rick Barnes has this team believing, buying into defense, and to talk about next year, where the volunteers bring in one of the absolute most loaded recruiting classes in all of America, right up there with all the top programs. Right now, they're ranked fourth. It could go even higher. So Wes Rucker is going to talk to us about Tennessee, the volunteers who took Rick Barnes, who has six conference coach of the year awards on his resume, the CA coach of the year, four times the Big 12 coach of the year with Texas, and the SEC coach of the year in 2018. He now has the volunteers program back on the national landscape. And Wes will tell us so many great things, especially how Rick Barnes seems to have John Calipari's number like no one else does. So let's bring in Wes. He'll talk about Tennessee Volunteers basketball. Let's dive in, talk about this year, and more importantly, preview next year where the Volunteers are loaded.
The Screen the Screener season review series rolls on today, and we head down to Tennessee to talk about the Volunteers. Tennessee Volunteers, a big-time program in the country under Rick Barnes, and who better to talk about it than Wes Rucker. Wes is a senior writer at Go Vols 24-7, covers the Vols for 24-7 Sports and CBS Sports, and he's a contributor at WBIR-TV. He is a must-follow on Twitter at Wes Rucker 24-7, and he joins us today to talk about Tennessee. Wes, how you doing? Are you staying safe? How are things down there in Tennessee? Doing all right. Yeah, the uh, appreciate you asking. Hope y'all are doing okay. The uh, m- my wife and I and Gus were all hanging in there, so uh, it's uh, certainly different. But you know, it uh, it could be worse. It could be worse for sure, and we're we're getting through it. Of course, we're trying to fill the void of no college basketball and no, and no March Madness here by doing a season review series on all the teams across the country. And of course, coming into this year, Tennessee. Lost a lot from that great team last year. Admiral Schofield, Grant Williams. So I'm curious, what were your expectations coming in? If you look at the preseason poll there, coming in, Tennessee was picked fifth, right in the middle, in essence, in the SEC, but always one of the top teams in the country and can challenge the SEC, any of those teams in that great conference. So coming in, West, what were your, your expectations for the Volunteers this year? You know, it's interesting because I was a bit more bullish than than I think most people were on the Vols. And, and I know that when you're a team like Tennessee and you lose four players to the NBA in one year, that's, you know, a normal year for, a, you know, a Kentucky or a Duke or, you know, Kansas or somebody like that. Um, for Tennessee, that's highly unusual. And, and so they had a lot to replace. And, and I thought they would do – I knew it would be kind of a sandwich year in some ways because I knew they weren't going to be as good as they had been the previous year. And, and I knew that they weren't probably going to be as good as they were going to be the year after that because they had all those studs from that ridiculous signing class coming in. So I knew it could be a sandwich season. But I was a little bit higher than I think most people were. And the reason was really simple – because Lamonte Turner was on that team. And I think a lot of people, if you didn't watch Tennessee closely over the past couple of years, you know, you saw him here or there, you probably thought that, you know, Turner or that, that, you know, Grant Williams and Schofield were kind of the alphas of that team. And, and I'm not saying they weren't, but Lamonte Turner was pretty much the heart and soul leader of that team. And, and he was the, the kind of their their little their little pit bull of a guy. I mean, he was the smallest guy on the floor, but you just didn't mess with him. He he hit big shots. He he stepped up and said everything needed to be said. He was an extension of Barnes out there. He was a really he's a really really tough dude, and he was going to be the leader of that team. Everything was going to be kind of built around him. And and I thought, you know what? There might be games where he tries to score forty points, but I'm going to enjoy that. That's going to be fun. And I just thought they would have a chance because. They had, you know, Bowden was a good player. They had some other guys that could emerge as good players. And and Turner was the heart and soul of that team. And then, of course, you know, Turner's arm falls off. And, and the whole season kind of goes off the rails for a while. But going into the season, I had higher expectations than where Tennessee ended up being. But that's because I thought Turner was going to be healthy. Yeah, and that team two years ago coming in, people forget they were 23-1. and one, And the only loss they had prior to the Kentucky game on February 16th, two years ago, was an overtime loss to Kansas, had the most efficient offense in the SEC. Turner, like you said, was a big part of that. So coming into this year, like you said, you had decent expectations. They had a nice win on a neutral against VCU, tough loss to Florida State. And then, of course, we hear that Turner, with the arm falling off in the shoulder, is out for the year. And I I think probably the first pivot point I want to talk about is that Wisconsin game. Because coming into that game, no Turner, Wisconsin can't win on the road, and it really was a a rough one there for Tennessee back on December 28th. It was, and I'll tell you, there's a really simple reason for that. Tennessee only played like two games after Turner went down but before Vescovi got there. And that was one of those games. And, and you know, for, for people who don't know or, or watch a lot of Tennessee, um, you know, Thompson Bowling Arena, the Tommy Bowl, it doesn't get nearly as much love as, you know, say Cameron Indoor or, or the Fog or Rupp or one of those. Um, but I've been to just about every place you can play basketball in this country in terms of the big places. And Thompson Bowling on its day is as loud and nasty and tough as anyone to play in the country. You got 20,000 plus people in there. They're going crazy. I thought that Tennessee, 
I knew Tennessee would be struggling in that game, and, and I thought Wisconsin might win it, but I thought the crowd would kind of give Tennessee a jolt like it normally does, and, and Tennessee would kind of find a way to hang around. I didn't think Tennessee would win that game just because you can't just take the the emotion, the emotional fire and soul leader out of a team and have no impact. But I thought the crowd could kind of push them going forward, and, and that really just didn't happen. And I don't know if it's because students were gone during break or what it was, but they were just flat and they couldn't hit shots and Bowden was struggling and, and Wisconsin just kind of just really buried them. And at that point I'm thinking, well, Viscovi better be, you know, the, the next Jesus, if they're going to go out there and, <laughs> and make something of the season, because th- there's, there's just no way that, that they can, that they can kind of get going from this. But, you know, it, it's, um, it, and cause people didn't know that, that Turner, it was not shooting well. He was shooting as poorly as he was in his entire career, much worse than he had ever been. And the reason was because his shoulder had been bothering him literally the entire time. And it was bothering him so much that he almost tried to go – that he, he, he practiced shooting left-handed in the entire summer before the coaches made him stop. Wow. That's how dedicated he was because they didn't know at the time that he actually had Markel Fultz's injury. So he wow. went to see like four specialists before they finally found out exactly what it was. So they kept trying to tell him that he would have a surgery and it would be better. And all these specialists across the country were telling him, yeah, we think we've got it f- fixed now. And they never had. And so Turner, again, thought he had everything fixed and it wasn't at all. And so he goes out there and he he just says, you know, screw it. I'm going to give up and shoot left-handed. But But that kind of tells you what he's about. And he just didn't make excuses. He was a tough kid. He, he he was going home crying about this thing, but he never let anybody else see it. So when you take a guy like that and you take that toughness and that kind of figure out of a team, that's going to leave a crater. And, and so when Wisconsin came in, they just kind of came in at the right time. They got Tennessee during that really gross kind of period there where they didn't have any point guards at all. And they really took advantage of them and blitzed them. And at that point, you're thinking, wow. Um, is this even an, an, an IT team? You know, you just don't know at that point. Yeah, and, and here in New Jersey on the East Coast, you know, I, I would admit myself, I chalked it up and said, okay, so maybe this is a, a sandwich year. You know, we'll see how Tennessee will, will fare. But a couple games that stood out that sort of raised my eyebrows, the first one, which I thought was a real tough spot, you come off the big win over Mississippi, who underachieved a little bit this year, but certainly very talented, a massive win there, won by 25 points. You go to Kansas Kansas coming off the Kansas State brawl, the whole thing. Here comes Tennessee. But honestly, they played very well in that game and, and in Fog Allen. And that's where I said, you know, maybe this team is, is, has something that they can really, you know, recover from with Viscovi. And after that, you were very competitive along the way. A nice win at Alabama after that game. You had a big one over Arkansas at home, lost a close one to South Carolina. Was that Kansas game maybe a pivot point for this team and their confidence? I, th- I think it was, and you know, the interesting part is that one of Tennessee's best players, Josiah Jordan James, had the worst performance of his career in that Kansas yes. game. He, yep. you know, the five-star freshman, he was, you know, at the time we didn't know this, but Barnes didn't tell us until after the fact that he had had a bad uh, hip again, that his hip had kind of flared up. The one that had kept him out of preseason camp, it flared up at just before that game. And so he was just, we didn't know why at the time, but he was terrible. But, you know, they had, you know, Pons and Fulkerson were two of the best players on the floor that day. And just kind of willed them back into the game, made some big shots, and and I think I don't I don't have the notes in front of me, but they led for a, a, a portion of the second half there, and I think they had the lead with like five six absolutely minutes ago, something yep like that. Mm-hmm. And it was it, it was it was and and, and don't get me wrong, uh, it was not like a, a a lackadaisical performance by Kansas. I don't think I don't think it was a it was, certainly wasn't the crowd's fault. The crowd was rock, and it was typical fog it was you know just fantastic um but tennessee made shot after shot after shot and get you know if they if they could have just gotten a couple more stops or if they could have kept um you know uh doke off the boards they they had a chance there but of course that's easier said than done because doke is, is doke i mean he's, he's huge but you know they were they were right there and i think that game showed them even in defeat hey we can do this and, and so i think they weren't perfect from that point forward but they made themselves more competitive because, you know, there were some things they didn't have, but what they had was enough that they kind of found ways and, and they were always coached really well and they they hung around. What was the mindset at the end of the year? Because their last three games, tough loss at home to Auburn to end the year, but prior to that, 
big win over Florida at home. And then, of course, the one that shocked me because I thought Kansas was the best team, in my opinion, going into the tournament. But I thought Kentucky was right there, assuming that Hagen's, you know, was going to be fine coming back, getting assimilated after he left the team a little bit. They had everything I thought to make a run as well. But then you guys go on the road to Kentucky and win 81-73 on March 3rd. That's the one that made me say, wow, this is impressive. Now you're looking at the end of the year, 17-14 and Tennessee team, 9-9, and fought all the way back here, overcame losing Turner. What was the mindset of the team? I mean, was it, listen, you know, maybe we can make a run in the SEC tournament and, and get into uh, the NCAs and, and make some noise? I mean, this, like you said, this was a sandwich year, but they really improved at the end of the year. Yeah, to your first point there, I agreed with you that I, ever since I saw Kansas in person, that to me was the best team in college basketball because – you know, college basketball is – you need a it, – it's good to have a big man or two that are good players. But if you don't have a really good backcourt, you just can't win at a high level in college basketball. The NCAA tournament is just all about guard play. And, and I think Kentucky had overall maybe a better backcourt than Kansas. But Kansas and Dotson had the best guard of the bunch in terms of a college basketball yes. guard. Yes, yep. He just com- he just completely controlled the floor on both ends. He, he 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 got everybody where he wanted them. Spaced the floor so well. Could could clear out and make shots when he needed to. Could get to the rim. Just a really really good player. And I think a guy that will have value in the NBA. And I, I think that some people are, are are. I think he might end up getting drafted a little lower little lower than he should. But but that game that game at, at Kentucky. It's interesting because I don't like to oversimplify things. But if you want to really, really oversimplify it, here it is. Uh, Pearl beats Barnes. Barnes beats Calipari. Calipari beats Pearl. Yeah, I know <laughs> that's oversimplification of it. Um, be, be, but, but you know, it's interesting because when, when Rick Barnes was hired by Tennessee, John Calipari said that people had no idea what kind of hire Tennessee just made and that Tennessee would make better commitments to basketball than Texas had and that Tennessee – people were going to look up in a few years and realize just how well they had it. Now, when he said that, he didn't know that his best friend Barnes was just going to beat him so often, um, <laughs> but he had. I mean, you know, it, it's Kentucky has not, you know, has not swept a season series over Tennessee in forever, and Tennessee has won. Uh, I think this would be the second consecutive Tennessee senior class that has a winning career record against Kentucky. They just, they, they, they've done really well, including they've played, you know, won a couple times at Rupp, and, and which is something even Pearl struggled to do. And, and I, you know, I, I can't really explain it other than things came together in those games. That that game there, uh, they were down by 17 in the second half, and it just, you know, because Tennessee all season had been a team that had lost kind of some of those double-digit second-half leads. Uh, it started to look like the NBA when you had a double-digit lead in the second half. That's nothing, you know. And, and they just they made the plays. Fulkerson could not miss. Uh, Pons woke up a little bit. Jalen Johnson made a couple threes. Bowden got going again. They got a couple stops. Um, really, they just – I've been going up to Rupp Arena since right around the turn of the century, right around the year 2000 uh, is when I started covering Tennessee. And I've been up there probably, oh gosh, at least 20 times now, I'm guessing. And, and I've seen a lot of games up there. Ha- my mother's family's from Kentucky, so I know all about that program and such respect for it. I have never heard Rupp Arena quieter than it was that night. I've never in my life heard it that quiet. Even when Tennessee has beaten Kentucky up there, I've never heard it as quiet as it was during that comeback that Tennessee had. It was just silent. People could not believe what was happening. And I, I can't really explain why everything came together the way it did. Um, but I think Kentucky kind of hit a wall. I think Tennessee got a lot of momentum, and I think Tennessee just believed it could go win that game. And, and it didn't make a lot of sense to me at the time. Uh, in fact, it was one of the most surprising wins or losses I've ever covered. Um, but you know what? When John Fulkerson's going to go out there and give you 27 and look like he's the best big man on the floor, you got a chance. Yeah, Fulkerson is is tremendous. I mean, heart and soul of the team. That was a shocker because Kentucky had won – Eight games in a row coming off the Auburn loss away, which was a tricky one. They were looking to continue rolling. And at home there, you expected that game to just move forward, and it, and it did. And it was a great comeback by Tennessee. And listen, next year, Wes, there's – before we get to the incoming class, which is loaded – 
you have a good group coming back. You lose Turner, obviously, and Bowden, but Fulkerson, Viscovi, I mean, a good bunch of guys coming back here. What are you hearing about Jordan James, Eve Pons, and those guys? Because, you know, like you said, this was a, a good end of the season that really could be a springboard next year for a Tennessee team that looks to be absolutely in the top 20. Yeah, I, I've got – there's no – uh, there's virtually no doubt in my mind that Josiah Jordan James will be back. I, I think that he knows he's capable of playing a lot better than he played for a chunk of this season. So I think he'll be back. No question. The, 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 the French guy is pawns and, and yes, I don't, I don't mean French, even though he is French, I'm saying to say French, <laughs> F R I N G E, not, not F R E N C H. Uh, because pawns is a guy who uh, he's not going to say anything about it and he won't confirm it. I'm not convinced he hadn't gone ahead and thrown his name into the hat without, you know, with the potential of coming back for next season. But I'm not so sure he hadn't already put his name in the draft. And, and that doesn't mean he can't come back because he, he certainly could. Um, but he's a guy who I think he's at least wanted to test the waters because he's a junior and he should. And he's the SEC Defensive Player of the Year. Uh, he is in my, you know, I, I try to stay as, you know, as, as bias free as I possibly can. I've not seen a better athlete than him in college basketball this season. Uh, he's just, I mean, I, you talk about a kid who I don't think he's ever seen a carb in his life. Uh, just, you know, <laughs> he's clean, works out. You know, he got to Tennessee looking the way he did right now uh, and it, basically looking like Megatron. And he had never lifted a weight in his life. It was the wow. most amazing thing I'd ever seen. He just basically did push-ups and sit-ups like a – Genetic, you know, Wes. Those are genetics. Yeah. Kid is just – you know, he's just unbelievably blessed and he is, uh, he's a really super kid. He's really quiet. He's a very mature kid. He's already married and, and he just, you know, he knows what he wants to do with his life and, and he's kind of emerging as finally becoming the basketball player people thought he would be. And so it's been interesting to watch him develop because I think he's kind of on the cusp of being something um, pretty darn good, but he's already maybe the best defensive player in college basketball. I've never seen a guy at six five or six six protect the rim the way he does. And you know, the question is though, could he? You know, his value is probably never higher than a second round NBA draft pick. So, is there a difference in if he goes out this year versus next year? I, I don't know that there is. That's the question he's got to go over in his mind. And the reason I say that is because if he comes back next season, you're going to ask me in a minute about the incoming class. Well, guess what? Shots are going to be harder to come by next season because you're not going to be a volume shooter on that team because they're going to be there's some really talented ball dominant guards coming in and you still got Fulkerson there. So it's going to be tough for him to to kind of be a big prolific scorer, which is not his game anyway. And, and I've talked to a couple of Eastern Conference scouts who have told me they really like Pawns and they're not positive they'd take him, but in the right scenario, they they might. And because they really would like to see him work out, which is unfortunate that they can't do that this year. Um, but, you know, it, it's it, it's I, I basically long story short, if I had to guess, I think he comes back, but I'm not positive of that. And and so basically you're bringing back all the, those guys. Uh, Vescovi probably will learn how to play something resembling defense going forward. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not gonna, right. you, know, you know, he it's funny because Rick Barnes is such a defensive stickler. That's their thing under him is they'll they'll run in the offense, but they really are just dynamite defensively. And Vescovi, um, I'm not saying he's not willing. He's just not been in the kind of shape to go do that because he just kind of showed up off of an airplane from Uruguay and they said, hey, go get him, kid. Here's LSU. So, you know, (laughs) that that, which was just remarkable what he did because, you know, (laughs) seven days after he's in the United States of America, he, he goes out there and puts up like 20 on LSU. And you're like, what are you doing? Where is this kid? Where'd he come from? But and the thing is, Vescovi the, was the lowest ranked player in that signing class uh, of the guys coming in next year. So that was kind of amazing what he gave them. But the, when you look at that core of what they got bringing back, that's a really good core. They're going to miss Bowden a lot. Uh, he's kind of been a tenant. He's been a star for four years. He's a local kid. Everybody loves the kid. He has a shot to play at the next level. They're they're going to miss him. There's no question about it on both ends of the floor. But with that core they're bringing back, you sprinkle in some of these newcomers and you've got what looks like a pretty good team. Yeah, you do. Great memory, too. Viscovi there in that LSU game, 18 points. He was uh, 6 of 9 from beyond the arc in that game. So just tremendous job by him. And listen, Tennessee defense is legendary. They were 15th in the country this year in two-point percentage defense. They allowed only 44%. So if he gets on board, I mean, that really solidifies the group. And 
and you touched on this recruiting class coming in. It is loaded. You wrote a great article on 24-7 Sports. Start off with Rick Barnes saying this group will bite you on both ends of the floor. And I, I think that's super appropriate. Talk about the group coming in. Jaden Springer, Keon Johnson, both five-star recruits. Springer is number four in Florida. Keon Johnson, number one in Tennessee. You have Corey Walker, who's a four-star recruit out of Virginia. Uh, and, of course, EJ Anasicki coming from Sacred Heart, who was one of the top five or six grad transfers. So, uh, Wes, go to town here on this class coming into Tennessee. Yeah, and they're also I, – I, you know, I, I was looking something up as you were asking that question, so I'm not sure I heard all of it if I'm being totally honest with you. And, and I'm not sure if you mentioned uh, VJ Bailey in there, the transfer. I did not know. Yeah, right. Who, if you've never seen a picture of that kid – I've got pictures somewhere that I took of him uh, on our Twitter uh, account, or you can go uh, to the Go Vols 24-7 or 24-7 Sports Database and see pictures of him. I mean, he looks like uh, a sawed-off Eve Pons. I mean, he's just ridiculously ripped, and he's a very good athlete. And there's a chance he's the starting point guard for Tennessee next season. So Yeah, for, yeah, for yeah, Morgan, I mean, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and and he's from Austin, Texas originally, so Barnes has known him and his family forever. Um, you know, his mom was a an Olympic caliber athlete or as a track person, I believe. He comes from a very athletic family. And and so um and you can tell also like him it's like have you ever even smelled a carb? You just look at him, you go, "What's wrong with these kids?" <laughs> I don't know, it's amazing what they can do strength and conditioning wise. It's but great for defense. Short, They're going to be long for defense. Jeez. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, and people talk about how Tennessee's not like the tallest team Team, um, but that's because Rick Barnes doesn't care nearly as much about height as he does about length. And, and his players, like um, you know, Grant Williams was six six or six seven, but had like a seven three or seven two or something wingspan like that. You know, I mean, they just they are six ten six. It was somewhere. All of his players basically have longer wingspan than their height because they're big on length defensively. And, and the bottom line is this: I, I've covered Tennessee for uh, all but two years, I think, of the past two decades. And because I went away for a couple years and came back and, and I've never I've never seen Tennessee have this kind of a signing class on paper. Rick, uh, Bruce Pearl signed a couple of classes. Bruce did that that were they were really good. But a couple of those guys th- that were five stars that came in with some baggage. There was a reason why they were available. Either there were, you know, some academic red flags or character red flags. And, and they, they ended up getting in school. But there were some questions there. These are guys that the the that Barnes is taking that everybody wants. Like Duke is trying to get these guys. Jaden Springer is a kid from North Carolina, a five star guard from North Carolina that North Carolina wanted, and wow. Tennessee got him. Wow! This is this is you know un, unprecedented for Tennessee. Keon Johnson. It just so happened that a kid from the Nashville area is one of the best players in this class, and he's the guy that I've probably heard the most buzz about already because uh, Jaden Springer is incredible. Uh, but Keon Johnson, the other five-star guard, is a guy who I think might really hit the ground running. He is a dy- dynamic two-way player, great defender. Uh, also, like Jaden Springer, has played with Team USA. So, I mean, th- these are guys that Corey Walker – I mean, Corey Walker is a top 50, top 55 caliber player, and he's like the third-ranked player in the class. And if normally this would be like the centerpiece of a Tennessee signing class, and he's the third best player in the class. So, yeah, and they're going to get, you know, EJ Anasicki, who has Tennessee bloodlines. His older sister won two national championships under Pat Summit at Tennessee. Uh, he's kind of a, a six, seven kind of versatile, you know, jack of all trades kind of guy. He'll step out and shoot a little bit, but he's a really elite rebounder which is something Tennessee needs and something they can pair with Fulkerson uh, to get some things going. And, and so I, I look at it and I plug those guys, including Bailey and Anasicki and Vescovi into that team now. And, and I look at a team that's not really, I mean, it could go, there's going to be two or three guys on this team who are really good, who are just not going to get many minutes. And, and that's a good problem to have as long as it doesn't turn into a bad problem. But uh, you're going to have, especially in the backcourt, there's going to be only one basketball, and there's a lot of guys out there who can play. So they're going to have competition every day because they also signed a couple of kids last year who I think are going to be good players. They just needed some time to develop. Like Ticket Gaines is a kid that I think could have a nice future in this game. He's the six seven guard, the freshman from Buffalo. Uh, he is just – I mean, I had one uh, NBA scout tell me this year, he, you know, that he hadn't seen – defensive hands on a on a college guard as good as his in a long time and i was like whoa you know i mean like in the sec you're like a tennessee he goes no like 
in college basketball. That's how good this kid's hands are. So I was like, whoa, that kind of took me back a little bit. But, you know, that basically they're bringing in a kind of, of athlete and a kind of team that really could have just about a little bit of everything because Uros Plasic, the seven footer, he'll be back and he'll have, you know, this season won't be like last season where he's waiting to see if he's eligible or not. He knows he's eligible. He can practice all off season like he's going to play. So that's going to be a big deal there. Uh, they've also got the Pember kid who I think could be a good player. Um, a, a kid who this time last year, people were talking about a lot. Um, Olivier Kumwa, the kid from Finland, uh, who they think kind of is in that Grant Williams mold. He'll be back for his sophomore season. They've just got a lot of options there. And uh, especially in the backcourt, there's going to be some tough decisions to be made there. But, you know, these kids that are coming in, here, here's what they give Tennessee. They give Tennessee two things that Tennessee badly, badly needed last season. And, and without Lamonte Turner, they just didn't have him after he got hurt hurt these guys right here can break you down one-on-one off the dribble which tennessee doesn't have a dribble drive offense tennessee has a very much kind of team centered um spread the floor you know motion cuts things like that tennessee kind of has one of those it's not at all a dribble drive offense but if you're late in the shot clock you need some dribble drive components so these guys give tennessee the ability to do that one-on-one that maybe they didn't have before or last season i should say And what they really do is they give you a chance to lock people up defensively one-on-one on on the perimeter, which only Bowden and Ticket Gaines could do last season. So they're going to give – they're going to patch two holes that Tennessee had and three if you can't Anasiki as a rebounder. They're patching holes that Tennessee clearly had last season. So it's not like you start trying to figure this out and you're saying, okay, is this a square peg in a round hole? No, these guys right here are fitting in – exactly to what Tennessee needed from last season. And that, to me, says that, you know, Rick Barnes and his staff know what they're recruiting. They know what kind of needs they're trying to fill, and they're getting good players for that. So I think last season was a lull uh, in large. It was a sandwich season. People kind of worried it might be after Turner got hurt. But I think they'll be back rocking and rolling next season. You can tell there's a strategy here. Gaines pretty much had to steal a game, and he was only playing 10 minutes per game. Anasiki comes over as the grad transfer, EJ Anasiki from Sacred Heart. He will provide depth up front. You talked about Keon Johnson. You talked about Jaden Springer, the seven-footer coming back as well. I mean, there seems to be a plan here, Wes. There seems to be they're, they're recruiting to that plan. And listen, your recruiting class right now coming in, if you look at it, there's Kentucky, there's Duke, there's North Carolina, there's Tennessee. The Volunteers are ahead of LSU, they're ahead of Arkansas, they're ahead of Auburn. So really, I would think expectations, you always want to be careful, of course, but I would think expectations very, very high for 2020, 2021. They are, and, and I think they're high within the program. Rick Barnes said this could be the best defensive team that he's had at Tennessee, um, You know, which is interesting because you know normally he'll wait for those kids to come in before he says something like that, but he's gone ahead and already saying that. Maybe he's imagining that Pons is definitely going to come back to say something like that. But, you know, I, I think that here's what's interesting about this Tennessee team. Uh, and, and I've talked to a bunch of people about this. I've been doing this for a while. Some of my good friends in the business, like, um, you know, Gary Parrish at CBS, um, Rob Doster at NBC Sports, uh, you know, some guys at ESPN, Brett Edgerton, just guys throughout the business that I've either went to school with or I've known throughout the years. And they, the thing that they've said about Tennessee, the common thread they've said about Tennessee for next season is this. Tennessee will be able to play any kind of lineup and any kind of opponent. So basically, Tennessee can go really small. It can have lineups with like Eve Pons at the five spot, and it can play. It, it can kind of murder ball you, or it can go with you know three guys that are like six six ten and above in the front line and go big if they want to. They can go fast. They can go slow. They can go man. They can go zone. Basically, they can. They can play any kind of way you try to trap them. They should have an answer for that with their personnel and their options. Now, the question is, when you do that as a team, can you really impose your will and your system on somebody if you're adjusting that much? That's one of the great questions in basketball that's really, really hard to answer. It's do you change what you do, you know, based on your opponent, or do you just kind of impose your will on opponents? And and usually the answer is somewhere in the middle, but what a lot of people like about this Tennessee team is the options it's going to have. And, and that will require a couple things. Most importantly, that will require unselfishness. 
And that's really not been a problem for Tennessee in the Barnes era. The way the personalities of these kids he's recruited, like Josiah Jordan James last season is a kid who I've never seen a five-star come in like a top 10 or whatever player come in and, and have that little that little ego, that much humility, and that much kind of team team. You know, he's just kind of team minded, team focused. So Rick Barnes tends to recruit those kinds of players at Tennessee and they've created an environment, um, you know, because when you build your program on guys like the Kevin Punters and Grant Williams and Admiral Schofields and Kyle Alexanders and Jordan Bones, when you get those kind of Lamonte Turner, Bowden, when you get those unselfish guys to be kind of your glue, the, the things that you the bedrock that you build a program on, you kind of start to build a culture. And at Tennessee, you hear that word a lot, culture. There's just kind of a culture within that program. And, and it, it, I don't think that's wasted. That I don't think that's just kind of a cliche. I think they mean that. I've been around these guys uh, more than enough to know that they really do kind of seem like a family. They they work hard, but when they're not, to, you know, when they're off the court, they um, they, they they play well together. They uh, Rick Barnes kind of becomes you know, like a dr- Marine drill sergeant during practice. And then everybody's goofy favorite uncle after practice. Uh, and, and they just, they, they enjoy being around each other. They have kind of a family vibe. They have a culture there. And, and I think that is something that helps them a lot because, you know, if they see some five-star players here or there, they can kind of blend them into that and they'll have a culture that can kind of maybe keep those kids heads on straight. So I think what they're doing here. Uh, is kind of what Calipari said they were going to do a few years ago when when Barnes got the job, is that as long as he's there, they're going to be in the mix. The question then becomes, can Rick Barnes get over that hump and get back to another Final Four? Because he's been to the tournament just about every year of his career. He's been such a great coach. He's a Hall of Famer, all those things. But what's he got to do? What's he got to figure out to get more success late in the tournament? And And – He's starting to build a roster that's going to give him a chance to do that if they can get the right matchups and if they can figure it out. If you take talent and flexibility and put it together, you have a lot of potential. And that's what the Tennessee Volunteers have next year. Folks, Wes Rucker, outstanding, outstanding job. Covers Tennessee, everything Tennessee. Go Vols 24-7. He's on CBS Sports, WBIR-TV. He's an expert for the Volunteers. Gave us some great insight there on the Tennessee basketball program. Must follow on Twitter at Wes Rucker 247. Wes, thanks so much, man. We appreciate it here. This is feeding us. We're, we're, we're full right now. We got some college basketball talk in and we're going to continue on with our season review series. But thank you so much here for a few minutes on what should be one of the best teams in the country next year in college basketball. No problem. Happy to do it. And I hope everybody out there had a good time listening to this. And we're doing this for a reason. And I hope everybody out there stays safe.